right, welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Today is Sunday, August 21st, 2016. I know it's the 21st because the Olympics end. Oh, yeah. Like right here in an hour and a half or so, is, or two and a half hours, I think, is when the closing. Uh, did you get to watch any of the Olympics? Um, you know, I, I watched a few of the swimming races, and, mm -hmm. and then I had other stuff to do, so that was pretty much it. I, I watched bits and pieces here and there. The, I like the Winter Olympics far better than the Summer Olympics, but... You know, to each their yeah. own. Well, I, I had to watch Katie Ledecky just destroy... All of her records? <laughs> world records, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, that world record I put up yesterday. Yeah. Psh, I can beat that. Screw that. Yeah, she I'm was, going for she it. was amazing. Yeah. Uh, there was lots of amazing. Um, and what else is going on? Well, this weekend is uh, Pride Festival here in Austin. Yeah, yeah this coming... This um, coming Saturday? Saturday, yes. Um, the 27th? Yes. Yeah. And as usual, the ACA will have a booth. So we'll be there. Come by and see us. I'll be there. Yeah. Have and a good time. I, I'm told, I don't have a booth number yet, so I don't know exactly where we're going to be, but it's going to be somewhere on the east side, which is actually, I think, a little better. Um, it doesn't tend to be quite as overwhelmingly loud on that side. Ooh, where's it at? Um, is it at On Time Shores? Or? No, it's over on uh, Jesse Segovia, um, that park over there. Okay. Um, you can find Fiesta, out at yeah, Austin Fiesta, Pride. Yeah, austinpride.org. But, so we are a live public access show that's not really on public access so much anymore because we do it from our own building that's here, right. uh, sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. This is the library, and it doesn't just consist of the handful of books you can see. There's actually another whole room yep. out there with books and books here and there and everywhere. And uh, the purpose of the show is to interact with the world to uh, talk about atheism, philosophy, etc. Talk to believers about what they believe and why. Um, to answer questions and try to support positive views of positive atheism and the separation of church and state. Or as my friend Amanda Kniff likes to call it, the separation of religion and government, which she says is preferable language to church and state. Yes. And since she's a lawyer who does this stuff, I'm going to take her word for it. Uh, I've been trying to actually change that, you know, to change how I say it. But yeah. when, you, when you said church and state for so long, uh, yeah. religion and government's not quite the easy shift to make. Um, Let's see, what else do we have in a way of announcements? Well, we got the back cruise coming up by uh, the yes. end of September. Yes, tickets are available online. So you can go to, um, let's see, www.atheist-community.org yep. and um, go to the store, and it'll um, direct you to purchase tickets for that. Um, we also have our pre-cruise lecture, which will be Greta Christina this year. It's going to be awesome. And so also coming down, Rebecca Witzman. Yep, that's right. So... It'll be a fun-filled adventure of life, which is yes. actually a phrase that is on a picture somebody gave me for my wedding. Ah, uh, okay. But, um, so we got that coming up. Um, in in Matt news, uh, which I'll keep really short, I, I got a bunch of stuff coming up, which I'll post on Facebook rather than just promoting here. But this, for people who know, I've been doing this Atheist Debates program for a number of years. It is community-sponsored. A huge thank you to everybody who's uh, been helping uh, support that. But this month is kind of unusual because I did a debate at the beginning of the month with Blake Junta on whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. And I posted that. That was the first video for the month. And I tend to try to do three videos per month. And then something strange happened. Uh, Blake agreed to drive down here from Dallas uh, this was this week. Uh, yesterday, he left to go back to uh, Chicago to Moody Bible College. Blake's a Christian apologist. We've had a number of debates. And normally, w when I do a debate, sometime many months afterwards, I'll go back and do a review. That way, I'm looking at it with kind of fresh eyes, and I can see some of the mistakes I made, some of the mistakes they made. We tried a little experiment because uh, Blake added something in his closing about methodological naturalism just out of the blue. So there are actually two videos that are going up today that will be live to the world tomorrow. The first is an hour-plus discussion with Blake and I where we kind of do a team debate review. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be an interesting experiment to get the person I debated to sit down and talk about what went right and what went wrong for both of us. Uh, it turned into another mini-debate, of, of course, as you would yeah. expect. And then there's a second video that's also well over an hour where we discuss the methodological naturalism and the process by which we come to or try to come to reasoned arguments. And there's a moment in that discussion, we spend a lot of time talking about Independence Day, the movie, fair warning, uh, because he's like, if you were living in that movie and the hunk of metal was hovering and you know blew up the Capitol, would you have enough yeah. 
evidence right there that we were under attack from aliens. And I was like, no. <laughs> Uh, but I would certainly lean that direction. You know? yeah. uh, he's like, oh, I'd be 99% confident. But we talked about how to demonstrate, for example, something that you can't test. You know, like we're in this world, if there's a supernatural realm, how do you investigate that? And the example I use is if I was sitting in this room, you're telling me there's somebody outside this room. And if I've lived here my entire life and there's no doors and windows and no way to investigate and I don't hear anything that, for all I know, the walls keep going forever. Mm -hmm. And yet you're saying there's somebody over there. And so I asked him, how do you, like, he said, okay, let's say I believed there was someone on the other side of there who was telepathic and telekinetic. And I said, great, perfect example. Please explain to me how you would demonstrate that this was real. And he's like, well, I would get, you know, a message in my head from this person that was saying I'm going to move these objects, and then those objects was moved. And I was like, that's brilliant. Can you do anything at all like that for God? Well, no, 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 but there's the fine-tuning argument, blah, blah, blah. So you can watch because the discussion goes on from there, and I think it exposes uh, a massive problem with his epistemology, and he, of course, th thinks it exposes a massive problem with mine. But I'll leave it up to you all to watch the both be live tomorrow. That's the end of what's going on with me. <laughs> it was too much fun. It was the two of us sitting on a love seat in my office, so it's nice and tight. Anybody who thinks we're not friends uh, it is, yeah. is clearly screwy, but... Uh, uh, you have a topic I that do. we actually want to address before we get to callers. By the way, the, the phones are live. I don't know for sure. It uh, looks like we've still got one line open. We'll get to those after Jen's done. And as a reminder, we've changed where we're going to dinner after the show. Um, I won't be able to be there today, but uh, we're going to Star of India, and they will put the address up on the bottom of the screen right there, uh, 2900 West Anderson Lane. You, we got an email from somebody who was not pleased with something Don said. Uh, yeah, um, and, and the topic today is kind of um, appropriate given um, the amount of rain we've had. <laughs> <laughs> well, I drove so, through Louisiana to Gulf Shores for my yeah, vacation. Yeah, so you've seen the, the whole... Each uh, way took two and a half hours longer than it should have because they had highways yeah. closed. We ended up driving through rural areas. We would come across areas that were flooded and have to turn around and go another way. Um, Gulf Shores was nice, but the drive back and forth was miserable. Yeah. I know, by the way, the Freedom, uh, not Freedom from Religion Foundation, the Foundation Beyond Belief is raising money to help with those people who have lost things, uh, homes, cars, uh, loved ones, in the flooding that's going on in Louisiana. Uh, so you can just do a quick Google for Foundation Beyond Belief and you'll find that stuff. But so anyway, rain. This, this guy, um, we'll call him Jeff, okay? okay? He contacts us um, actually on Facebook and by email and initially, um, his ass is chapped because of something that Don Baker said in 2009. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> hey, a, Shatner, you remember in episode 121? What, no, get a life. Yeah, so th this guy, Jeff, is a Mormon. And he was uh, really upset that Don Baker said that Joseph Smith was a con man. And it's not that Don was wrong or ignorant or anything like that. It was that he lied. Because, he lied. Yes. It had to be that he lied. He could not have been mistaken. Um, in any case, um, this sort of, I, I guess once he he got that, you know, um, the bit in his mouth, he decided to, to run with it. And so he contacted us again, both on Facebook and by email, to tell us that um, in the Bible, I, I'm, I'm going to read Part of what he wrote here it says in the Bible it turns out that Noah and the flood can be taken literally in Genesis when Moses says when Moses says that the flood was upon the face of the whole earth he actually just attributes that to Moses um, he's talking about where Noah was and not a worldwide flood well he's so this would have been generally considered all of the first five books are considered written by Moses okay. even though we so, can't demonstrate yeah that. so, so yeah. Um, it says that uh, Genesis never says that the flood was worldwide and the Bible does not support it. Okay, so um, interesting to see what the Bible actually says because Genesis uh, 6.17 says um, God is saying that a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh and he goes on to say that everything in the earth shall die. So um, it actually does, if you're, if you're talking about a literal interpretation of, of the flood story, um, God is literally saying he's going to kill everything. Um, and it really doesn't make sense that, you know, it, it supposedly 
Noah and, and, you know, this tribe in this part of the world is supposedly God's chosen people, but he's going to wipe them off the face of the earth and leave everything else and everyone else. Um, that actually doesn't make sense. Um, that said, you could make a case for a local flood story. It's just that if you do, then you can't take that part of the Bible literally anymore, unless by literal you mean not at all literal. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thing is, when you start talking about whether or not you can take something literally, um, as soon as it says that it's going to flood to all the world, yeah. even the people who are making a case for this being interpreted, best interpreted as a local flood, yeah. have to then say, okay, the language here that says all the, all the world in English really just meant all of the known world to the author. Yeah. And I get that. And I might even buy it, but you don't get to say literal anymore. Right. Exactly. It's a, that then becomes an interpretation, which is not a literal reading of the text. Okay. And in fact, if you go on and you read Genesis 7, verse 23, it said, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the earth. And it goes on to say, you know, and only Noah and the people that were with him on the ark survived. So this does seem to indicate that um, if you want to take this literally, that they're talking about killing everything on the earth, at least everything that breathes air. Um, so again, you know, if, you, if you're going to argue that this is to be interpreted as sort of a homily, you know, or, or something like that, then that's, that's one thing, but that's not literal. Um, but you have a big problem anyway. As soon as you move away from flooding the entire earth, mm -hmm. because this is God looking down and saying, uh, you know, mankind has become so depraved that, uh, I mean, they're just all so terrible that the only people I will save are this drunk and his family. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll just go from there. But if you turn this into a local flood, then it's not a judgment on all of mankind. It's a judgment on these people in this region. Exactly. Which would explain why the Egyptians didn't seem to notice this flood in their yes. records. But uh, it doesn't explain how this in any way deals with the subject of God hitting a reboot switch. You know, exactly. It creates Adam and Eve. It goes wrong. Uh, the next thing you know, these people are just doing all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to hit a reboot and start all over again with just Noah and his family. That doesn't work either. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Well... And, and so the question becomes, it's like, okay, if, if we say that, you know, this is not to be interpreted literally, um, it's, and it's just a local flood, does that rescue the story of, of Noah and, and the ark? And so the question then becomes, what else does it say in here? For example, how long was the flood? And that's a little confusing if you read Genesis. It, it's like, okay, it says it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, and then something about the waters were upon the earth for 150 days, but, you know, Noah didn't come out of the ark until seven months, or maybe it was 10, or was it a year? How long was the flood? But we know, even if we say, okay, it's raining for 40 days and 40 nights, and there's a lot of water, and this ark has to float, apparently for about 150 days. How do we do that? Because what we have is a wooden boat, right? And the Bible tells us a little bit about what this wooden boat looked like. So Although for, I, think, I, think, I think, if I'm remembering correctly and, and looking at other information, it says it receded after 220 days. So that's, that's, when it yeah. would, that's when the flood would have ended was 220 days. Yeah. So, but again, it's, there's like a mishmash of stuff. We can't really tell how long this flood's going on here and, and when the water's finally receded. But what we can, can look at is... Uh, the fact that, um, according to the story, God told Noah to build this wooden boat. So the first thing we need to do is, let's take a look at when this is supposed to happen, because that tells us kind of what kind of technology was available to people at that time. So if you look at the dates, it puts it kind of in the early Bronze Age here. So based on that, um, the best tools we would have available to construct a large ship would be either bronze or copper, depending on whatever the local culture was, and there'd probably still be a lot of stone tools in use as well. So we've got an illiterate goat herd who is not near um, like um, a sea or anything, so no prior experience with shipbuilding. He's been told to build this large ship 
and he's got to use whatever tools he has at hand. Um, and it's made of gopher wood, which we don't really know what kind of wood that is, but um, we'll just say it's a it's a hard wood that's suitable for building ships. I think it just means any wood, because, yeah. you know, basically he's got his three sons, and he's like, hey, you go for some wood, you go for some yeah. wood, and you go for some wood. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, so they, they, they go for the wood, and they got to build this thing that measures 300 cubits long and 50 cubits wide. And so then we've got got to ask ourselves, what the hell is a cubit? We don't know, for example, for exa exact what the cubit is, but... Maybe he had really short arms. Yeah. So we know that um, there was like a short cubit or what they call a common cubit, and then I guess the, the long cubit or whatever. So it's between 17 and a half and 21 and a half inches, approximately. So that means that the arc was between 437 and a half and 537 and a half feet, roughly. Um, and so a lot of the biblical literalists seem to think that the, the ark was about 500 and feet, 515 feet long, and so that's within the range of possibilities. So we'll say, okay, it's 515 feet long. So what's the problem? How big is Ken Ham's? I don't know. I don't know uh, let, me, let me look that up while you're doing yeah. this. Yeah, okay, yeah, you look that up. So, so um, now, we know that this boat, 515 feet long, made of wood, and... There are some problems with wooden ships this long being seaworthy. And one of the problems is that there's this thing called hogging and sagging. So um, let's see, sagging is where the ship bends downward in the middle, and hogging is when it bends upward. Um, and so basically, um, the, uh, the rigidity of the keel prevents it from putting too much stress on the vessel. Um, but the middle of the ship is more buoyant than, than the ends, and so that's where the hogging comes in. It basically pushes the middle of the ship up. I got it. Yep. Hold on. So 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, and 51 feet high. Okay. By the way, this is a quote from the Ark Encounter website. Ark Encounter features a full-size Noah's Ark built according to the dimensions given in the Bible, spanning 510 feet, 85 feet, and 51 feet. This modern engineering marvel yeah. amazes visitors, young and old. Yeah, they're amazed because you've constructed a, mar a modern engineering marvel, although not so much, that would have been impossible for Noah and his three sons. Exactly. So anyway, we're talking about um, hogging and sagging. So basically what this does is that it puts, puts stress on the structure of the ship, and basically what happens is it leaks um, because you can't, you can't seal a wooden boat well enough to, uh, to prevent water from intruding. Oh, but they sealed it all with pitch. Yeah. Yes. Within and without, right? With yeah. it, pitch. Exactly. Where did that come from? And how long did that take? I don't know. Um, May, maybe it didn't take place in Israel. Maybe it was like by the La Brea tar pits. I think it was nice and easy. It, it, you know, God, God put Noah just the right place to get exactly well, what he needed. What I can tell you is that there's... You can't put enough pitch on a wooden boat that size to keep it from leaking. Because um, these leaks, they're not small leaks, okay? Um, so we actually do know what happens when we build long wooden ships because um, we've actually built those um, at times when we could actually document their construction. So um, the longest wooden boat that was ever built was the schooner Wyoming, which was 450 feet. Um, that was tip to tip. Um, the dimensions between perpendiculars were, it was 330 feet, um, and that's, that's actually still well short of the dimensions that are claimed for the Ark. And the Wyoming um, also had 90 diagonal iron cross braces on each side, which was not available to Noah to build the Ark. Um, and well, he had the elephants in there, and they were holding the sides ah, together. Ah, been it, yes. And it also had um, a steam-powered pump to keep her hold relatively but not completely dry because she leaked like a sieve, and she eventually foundered at sea. Well, when you've got that many animals, they can just drink all the water that uh, gets in through the leaks. But I mean, it's salt it's easy. waters. <laughs> well, God can yeah. magic the salt out of it. Yeah. After all, he made it so all the salt water and freshwater fish managed to survive this flood. Yes. So basically, um, we, what we have is this idea that an illiterate goat herd with Bronze Age tools, 
could have built a ship the size of the Ark that was seaworthy enough to withstand um, 150 days at sea, um, best case, um, without capsizing, because we haven't even considered dynamic stability of, of the Ark. Um, and with those dimensions, there would be some issues with that. Yeah. So, so, you know, even if we claim this was a local flood, it doesn't actually rescue. Yeah, if we give all the benefits of the story. doubt, this is still just a story. Can't do um, it. Yeah. But, I, and, you know, God had them all go in the boats like seven days before it started raining. Yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what? You know, from, from a narrative perspective, it's brilliant because the seven days while they're waiting for it to start raining, they're living on the boat with all these animals and they don't have access to, you know, the food and stuff that was at their house there. And people are coming up mocking them. So the only point to have them getting in there a week early is so that all these people can come over and say, oh, look at that dumbass boat you built. Well, yeah. I'll mock Ken Ham for way more than seven days because I think it's going to take a little longer for that for Ark Encounter to go bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, but I hope as it sinks that the chain attaching it to the Creation Museum drags that monstrosity to the depths of the ocean as well. But anyway, um, so to kind of wrap this up, uh, Jeff's argument actually is not with us because we don't believe the Ark story um, should be taken literally at all. We understand that it's basically a blatant ripoff of an earlier myth, um, a Babylonian story about a flood. Um, Jeff's argument is actually with other biblical creationists who insist on a literal interpretation. That and the entire Mormon church that has managed to convince him that a con artist wasn't a con artist. But yeah, but they're lying about that. They could be. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the documentation seems to seems to counter that. All right, yeah. so we've got uh, callers lined up, and we'll go there in just a All minute. Right. Last little bits of stuff before we take callers. We're running until about, we got about an hour and eight minutes or so left in the show. Uh, I, there's always going to be more announcements than we can uh, ever remember to get to. We've already hit the main ones. But I did want to say that uh, I've had a couple of weeks away from the show, and I don't always get a chance to catch up. And uh, we get far more email than any of us can possibly look at, let alone respond to. But you can email tv at atheistypeandcommunity.org, and a good chunk of that will actually be viewed by someone. But if you don't get a response, and it's really important, send it again, and you know, note that you've tried to email before, and yeah. I can't, still can't promise a response. Uh, what's interesting is we'll get an email and it'll just happen to pop up while I'm working on something else and it'll have an interesting title. Uh, yeah. Somebody emailed yesterday to say, hey, what are your thoughts on Hinduism? And I know this is, this is a really quick response. I have no idea. I need to know what you believe and why. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I need to know what your specific beliefs are, you know, because um, he's a non-theist Hindu, Hindu. And, and by the way, so. um, an email with the title proof of god in all caps yeah. and then we find out oh just kidding i'm an atheist i just wanted to say you know that would not be an interesting email you definitely won't get a response from that the thing is is that every time somebody emails in with a joke title and a yeah. they start off with a joke there's somebody who has sent almost that exact thing in and sincerely believes it yeah so you know i, I don't don't need the joking with it's gotten to the point now where somebody emailed us this week and said here's my absolute proof of God and I wrote them back and I said if you're actually serious I will do my best to respond to these points but your email is so ridiculous I don't think that you're being serious yeah. and I hadn't heard back but it's it's entirely possible that this person was being serious yeah so and also uh, last note on the email because this amuses me I actually uh, shared this with Blake there's a, someone who emailed this week, and it's not the first time this has happened, with absolute proof that God doesn't exist because he has a new model of physics and a special yes. infinity. Um, and that if we want attention, we should help promote his new website. Yes. Um, okay. If you think that you have come up with a new physics model, a new philosophical model, why are you emailing the jackasses at the Atheist Experience <laughs> yes. Show instead of going after scientists and philosophers and the experts in those fields? And why is your website a rambling mess of MS Paint images and diagrams describing yes. this? Rather, it's 
it's so obvious that there's nothing there that I would care about or, or of substance. Um, but I get it. Not everybody is um, of sound mind. But you could at least use the same font, the same font size throughout the entire... You watch it. It'll all be Comic yeah. Sans. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's get started. We've got Drake. Thanks for waiting on the line. Hello, Drake in New Orleans. Are you there? Hello, Drake. All right, Drake, we'll put you back on hold because you probably got tired of listening to us and went off to the restroom. So, Chan in Shreveport, Louisiana, are you there? Yes. Hey, Matt. Hey, thanks for waiting. How are you doing in, in Louisiana? Are you flooded? No, I'm not. I'm actually in, in Northwest. Yeah, Shreveport. Uh, Shreveport. Yeah, you're, you're pretty safe yeah, there. Yeah, so I'm a good ways from there. So we've had some rain, but not like people in Baton Rouge are getting. So I, I'm, I don't have to get on the ark. I tell you what, I had to drive so far. I mean, we came over I-10, I-12, and they were shut down. I had to drive so far north, I might as well have driven up to Shreveport to get back home. Yeah, yeah. So. Anyway, you had a question for us. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Matt, I've listened to you for a while, and I've, uh, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I enjoyed listening to um, some of the things that, that you've talked about, and I've always wanted to uh, call in on you, and... Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about free will. Um, I know that theists um, and atheists, uh, well, atheists have different views on, on, on free will. So do Christians. Um, you know, yes. I'm actually true. watching yeah. a debate. I'm, I'm halfway through a debate today between uh, Matt Slick, a Calvinist, and um, okay. another, another Christian. They're arguing over the issue of free will versus election um, and, and how, how one attains salvation, et cetera. But go ahead. Yeah, and, and I'm familiar with, with Matt on that, but I wanted to see what your view is on, on free will. Do you think free will um, in a materialistic universe, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, do you think that free will exists? Do you think that we um, are, are de the choices that um, we have, if atheism is true, is, is determined? What, what is your view on that? So it's really kind of complicated. I'll sum it up quickly. There's no one atheist position on free will, and it depends on the definition of free will. There are people who think we don't have anything at all. Uh, most, people, most atheists I know reject the libertarian notion of free will, um, okay. which, which is that you could have you know, done otherwise, et cetera. Right. But my, I have always, well, I have for the last 15, 20 years, been a compatibilist, a la Daniel Dennett that free will is not incompatible with determinism. Now, I agree that under most definitions, free will, what we would describe free will is an illusion, but compatible with free will, the best way I've come up to describe what I'm talking about is this. Jen could get up right now and walk out that door, or I could grab Jen and drag her out the door. The difference between those two scenarios, I think, is everything that I identify as free will and that other people identify as free will. Because all we're really looking for is what is it about this particular agent that we can attribute responsibility to for their actions? And when are my actions being violated, not by the physical facts of the universe, but by another agent? Um, and that is, that is the extent of anything that I would call free will. Um, we, we make choices. The universe, by the way, is not purely deterministic, but it is generally deterministic. If we rewound the universe to the beginning and pushed play again, would I be sitting here right now having this exact same conversation with you, saying the exact same words? And I, I don't know. Um, all I know is that I, I live in a world where I apparently make decisions, whether or not they're predetermined or not is irrelevant. I'm able to reflect on them. I'm able to change my mind or apparently able to change my mind. And so are other people. And I'm sitting here as an actor, as an agent. And so I bear some responsibility for the actions that I take. And that th there is a difference between me pointing a gun at somebody or someone placing a gun in my hand and having them move my arm and point the gun at somebody. Th th there's a difference between those two. And that is the extent of where I would define free will is in that gap between the two. So did, did I hear you say, I heard you say illusion, that free will is an illusion. Is that the position that you take? 
Well, I think what most people define as free will either doesn't exist, or well, I wouldn't say exist anyway, because exist implies like it's a thing. Um, but I would say what most people think of as free will probably isn't real. And what a lot of people think of as free will is almost certainly an illusion, this illusion of choice and, and things like that. Um, and what I'm describing as free will in the compatibilist sense is really about uh, actor, agents' responsibilities and what desires you have and whether those desires are being impeded by some other agent. Yeah, the problem that I have with the, the illusion part is if if free will, as we're talking about it, and I'm assuming you and I are using the same definition of um, I, I, I could choose uh, to do Act A or I could choose to do Act B or whatever. I guess that's what I mean by free will. But when I hear that free will is or maybe be an illusion, that seems to me to be problematic because if – free will is an illusion how would we have knowledge that's in the it's an illusion it's almost like like when we're asleep and we have a dream we really think when we're asleep that those those dreams are real but when we wake up when we get outside of the dream we're like oh okay that was just a dream so even if this whole free will thing is an illusion how would we have knowledge that it's an illusion that seems to be problematic for the agent. Oh, not okay. I thought you were asking how would we have knowledge at all, but you're saying if free will is an illusion, how could we possibly know it was an illusion? Yes, that to me seems to be a problem um, because I know Sam Harris has made that statement that he seems to be that free will is an illusion, but to me that seems self refuting because how would you know? How, how do you find out whether or not a mirage is real? Well, it depends. Um, you get closer to it and you find out more information, obviously, like if yeah. you're driving down the road, it looks like water. Yeah, so what neuroscientists are doing, what neuroscientists have done is measure decision-making. And um, the current best studies, which may not be accurate and they may have their flaws too, seem to indicate that your brain makes a decision before you're aware of it, and then you rationalize that decision after the fact and basically deceive yourself into thinking you made the choice. I mean, your brain still made the choice. It's not like that you and your brain are separate, but we're talking about the difference between a conscious reflective awareness portion of your brain and just a base portion of your brain. Um, as somebody who's been doing illusions for his entire life, I can tell you that the fact that there is an illusion doesn't prevent you from knowing that it's an illusion. As a matter of fact, there are people who have yeah. no idea how I would do a certain trick, and yet they still know it's a trick. I know exactly what you're talking about because I, I enjoy magic on the side. I'm a school teacher, so you got to have something to keep the kids occupied sometimes. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about there. But the the I, I get that part, but what I'm saying is I, it just seems to me that the – and it sounds like you're talking about uh, – because you said your brain – and, and you being a uh, would, would you identify yourself as a materialist, a naturalist? No, I'm, so I'm a methodological naturalist, not a philosophical naturalist. But the natural world is all I can investigate until somebody shows me a way to do otherwise. Okay, so it seems to me that the the free will. It seems to me like I'm making a decision. It seems like yeah, that that's... you and I are having a conversation right now that that and... I can think and. And would it, seem, would it seem the same whether that was real or an illusion? Would it seem the same if it was real or an illusion? Yeah, so it's an experience that you're having, and you said it seems like, you know, X is happening. And my point is... Yeah, but I don't, I don't have any justification to think that that is an illusion. Okay, that's, where, mean, the, that's like, where the neuroscience comes in. That's what, what do you mean by that, that... The investigation. The neuroscience the investigations into decision making seem to indicate that when you think you've made a conscious decision and weighed the evidence and reached a conclusion, that this isn't what's happening. Now, I'm not saying that there may be incredible problems with the study. So I'm only putting it out there because this is what Sam Harris is relying on. Um, and I'm not going to disagree with him on. On what the science currently shows, I may disagree with them about what conclusions you can reach. 
But at the end of the day, set all that aside. If you feel that you have what you're going to call free will, and you have okay. no way of telling whether it's an illusion or not, does it make any difference? Aren't you still Real you? Hard. Aren't you still you, still making decisions, still feeling like you're making decisions? Yes. Okay. So yes. then then it just falls, at a minimum, it falls in the category of things we don't know. Although Jen may have a completely different take on this. I didn't want to monopolize it. Well, when I, I would consider myself a dualist, so I would say that it's the, um, the immaterial I that is making this decision and not my brain. Right? Yeah, and I'm not a dualist because I see no justification for the idea that there's a soul. Right. Well, and I would understand why you would take that position, but me as a theist would, would say there seems to be this mind-body problem from the atheist perspective. And uh, uh, what, what's and the I problem? Still have a, yeah, I don't. Uh, what, what's the problem? The problem is that, well, I don't even know where to, to begin. This, uh, th there seems to be some immaterial realities that we can access, like the laws of logic and reason. You and I are using that right now. Okay, to, so but so that's not that's not evidence for a soul or dualism. So we have right. we have physical things, we have conceptual things, and then we have the things that are that transcend those, like the laws of logic. They're, they're just truths that we accept as a presupposition. When you say you're a dualist. If you're convinced that there, you know, the solution to the mind-body pro problem is to come up with an immaterial, you know, supernatural soul, what's the justification for believing that that is the right answer? Well, I don't know if it's the right answer on that. This is one reason why I'm continuing to search for uh, truth. Um, um, I, I think it, when I think about free will, I know that just through self introspection that I'm making these decisions and of course I could be wrong about that it, it, it could be the position that, that you're talking about but the theistic perspective seems to make a little bit more sense even though I can't prove that there's a lot of things that you know um, I can't prove about that sure and we just that we why, why? we assume why does it why does it make okay so we're in this situation where you and I both seem to experience something and yeah. my position is I have no idea but I don't have any justification to reach to the supernatural and so at a minimum the idea that it might be an illusion or that there's something going on that I don't understand is as close to an explanation and I'm at least fine for now with saying I don't know what the answer is and yet, for you, the theistic proposition that there's a soul makes more sense. And I'd love to know how something can make more sense when you acknowledge that you can't test it, you can't investigate it, and you can't provide evidence for it. To, because to me, when somebody provide. says, can, to me, when somebody says that this explanation um, it seems better when it's the sort of explanation that you, you can't provide any evidence for, or you can't provide any good evidence for. Um, all they're really saying is, I prefer this. And that's not a pathway to truth, that's just what you're comfortable with. No, I, I, don't, I don't prefer it. You know, I, I think that that's really, really true, but the theistic position is not just based on the one thing of free will. I think it's a cumulative a cumulative case on um, the existence of God and and the, the how humans interact. There, there's there's a number of things, and of course, you know, I could spend the whole time on your on your show talking about uh, the cumulative case, and I know you're familiar enough with that. Um, I I guess the reason why I brought this up is I haven't talked to. Um, enough people from the atheist perspective because there's not one there's not one way that atheists have described the the um the free will issue and I, I wanted to Correct. you know hear your hear your perspective on this. Um yeah no I get it. I, it's it's one of those things where this is this is and this is not intended to be uh insulting. 
this is one of those things where we have what appears to be an unsolved mystery, which may not even be a real thing. It may be that there's just, you know, we've, we've invented this uh, problem and are now looking for solutions for it. And the atheist or non-theistic uh, perspective does not have an explanation. We don't have an explanation for the origin of the universe. You know, we can't tell you why things are the way they are or any of those other things. And the theistic right. uh, perspectives do offer an explanation. Now, the question is, what reason do we have to think that the theistic expl explanation is right? And I can't find any good reason. And what I tend to hear is, well, at least it's an explanation. You guys don't have one. Well, that's, that's a fallacy. That, that, you know, I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you, Matt. At all. And, and I think many theists are arguing the wrong way. I, I don't think by saying because you lack an explanation that therefore atheism is false. Is that what you're saying, that the way that theists argue? Is that what, is on that on, on occasion, I don't think they explicitly do it. But I think, okay. I think they intuitively do it because there's a comfort to having what you think is the right answer. Of course, yeah. it feels like this is the best explanation because it seems to be an explanation. The problem is it doesn't explain anything. It's just an attempt to solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. Because if you say well, that, you know, oh, the explanation to the mind-body problem is substance dualism, that there is a soul that is the pilot of the ship. Really, I did a whole debate on the soul. Do you know that when we like have people with brain damage, um, where uh -huh. their entire personalities are reset, their memories and everything else, what if that person was a Christian and then they suffer brain damage and now they're an atheist? Yep. Yes, what, I've heard of that. What happens to their soul? And, and I, that's a great question. That is an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. I've, I've had Christian kids and, and um, other Christians ask me that question. And I do not know the answer to that question. I think it's a fair question. It's another one where you would just have to say, look, we, we don't know. Okay. We don't, but I, I, I'm fine I, with I, I don't know. But the thing is... Yeah, and Matt, Matt I don't take the position that um, I want to find an explanation because it, I'm comfortable with it. I, you know, you, you said something before on your shows, and I really like it. I agree with it. You say, I want to believe as many true things as possible and as few false things as possible. Correct. I wish I, all Christ, Christians would listen to that because you're right. I agree with you. I'm the same way. And I think there's a few ways we can do this. One, we can believe everything, and you would have all truth, everything. You would believe all these true things, but you'd have a lot of false things. Too. Right. Or you could not believe anything at all. And you wouldn't have any false views, but you wouldn't have any true views as well. And I think your approach is correct. You you weigh every claim to see the evidence for it, to see the evidence against it. I agree with that. And cool. I think that's where you and I can have common ground. And I try to... Well, if we do have that common that. ground, then please explain why my answer to the question, is there a soul, is I see no evidence for a soul and cannot believe it. And you, on the other hand, seem to believe that there's a soul. Yeah, I believe that there's a soul. I mean, obviously, I can't prove it. I think there's because the soul is an an, an immaterial thing. Um, uh, but what difference does it make uh, if it's immaterial? I mean, that to me seems like an excuse because you're saying I believe it, but I can't demonstrate it. Why would you believe something that can't be demonstrated or that you can't demonstrate? That I can't demonstrate? Sure. Can uh, anybody? Well, huh? Can anybody demonstrate that there's a soul, or has anybody? What would you mean by? What would you mean by demonstrate? Well, pretty much like the same thing it... I would mean for anything else. There, you, you would need positive evidence for a claim, and it would need to be demonstrated to a reasonable satisfaction. Yeah, are you familiar with the um, the writings of J.P. Moreland on that subject? Yep. Yep. Yeah, he's he does a little bit better um, explanation of it than I can as far as defending the way he does it. Um, I'd have to go re rework the, the literature and and Matt, I'm, I could be wrong about this. Sure. So, but the thing I, is, I, if you I, honestly I, care, to, you want to believe as many true things, as few false things as possible. Then one of the things that yeah. happens is you can't believe things, you you can't reasonably believe things that you don't understand and can't defend. So, like for example, I don't accept string theory. It may well be. Correct. I, I, my limited understanding of it is such that 
I view it as an unfalsifiable proposition that is akin to math with magic. Now, it may, I don't think it has met, I don't think it has established what some, including many in the science fields, uh, represent as truth. Um, could be completely wrong, but I can't say that I accept it. If you acknowledge that you can't, you know, that this is beyond comprehension, that it's beyond investigation, um, and then just want to say, well, there's other people who understand this better who have offered their explanations. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know how that, is, how that sits with trying to believe things that are true. It's, it's, it seems to me like there well, has to be some preference there. Well, there's nothing wrong with holding a truth in tension. Uh, I think as a Christian, there, there, are many, there are many views, I don't say many, but there's some views that, that uh, I hold that are in tension because I, I haven't fully uh, wrestled with them in the sense that um, they, like, for example, the, the problem of, of evil, and, you know, how could a loving God allow evil in that? Those are the questions that, that we as Christians wrestle with, too, and, but that doesn't mean that there's not an answer. We just don't know how that works. So you, you do realize that, that you don't have to wrestle with that problem if you don't begin with the unfounded belief that there's a God. No, it is. No, no. There's there's very good evidence for the existence of God. Okay, what? Um, yeah. Yes, please. Well, uh, I, I know you're familiar with the, 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 main, the classical arguments, so I won't try to go through them, but uh, the cosmological, the moral, the teleological argument, all of those, when put together, show that it's more reasonable to believe in God. No, they don't. No, they not. don't. Yeah, I, I no. think so. Okay, well, I, I don't. Yeah. And so here's the thing. You've heard an argument or several arguments, and you think combined that it's reasonable to accept their conclusion. And I've heard those same arguments and debated them for right. years, and I don't think it's reasonable to accept the conclusion. How do we resolve that? Because if we were talking about anything else, like evolution, um, it doesn't matter whether or not you're, you're convinced. It matters what the evidence points to. Yeah. So, so how do we, you know, if, if so let me, let me, well, Matt, let me, let me see if I can, let me see if I can expose this. Point. Let me see if I can expose this. So okay. the God that you believe in, is it the God of the Bible? Yes. Okay. The cosmological argument, teleological argument, moral arguments, they don't in any way point to the God of the Bible. Matter of fact, the cosmological argument doesn't even have, doesn't even have as a conclusion that a God exists, or at least not the You're Quran. Right. Okay. You're absolutely right, because that's not the goal of the cosmological argument. Right. The goal of the cosmological argument is to show that the universe has a cause. That's right. it. So you can't, you can't extrapolate the argument further than it's designed to go. I agree with you there. Okay. I, I agree 100%. Um, but it does have some implications of it, because whatever calls space and time cannot be part of space and time. Okay. That's what, that's the implications of that. So it does have some implications. Sure. But so you don't, I, I, you, you can't get from X has a cause to therefore the cause is a thinking agent that exists outside of space and time, which also happens to be the God of the Bible. You can't get there. I agree with you, Matt. I agree with but you. But yet you got there. Yeah. Well, but it wasn't through just the cosmological argument. Okay. The, what was the it? Case, the case for Christianity is, is not boiled down to just one argument. It's, it's a compilation of multiple arguments. I, I, and, I understand um, that. So, so, so yeah. you, we're, we're defending Christianity right now, right? So, yeah. y your view is that there's a God. Um, yes. Presumably, does he interact with reality in any detectable way? Um, yes, I believe so. If you're asking me about miracles. Okay, how do you detect that? How do you detect a miracle? Well, you, I, I'm, I asked you if he, inter if he interacted with reality in a detectable way, and you said yes. And so I want to know how you detect that. How would you, okay, well, <laughs> there's a couple of different ways. One, the biggest one of them all is the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus rose from the dead. But I don't have any reason to believe yeah. that's the case. But even if I did, how does that, how, how did you detect that and investigate it and con confirm 
that the best explanation for Jesus rising from the dead is God? Um, because if Jesus rose from the dead, then we have historical evidence of a divine miracle. Which no, means that God no, you know? have, no, you have evidence of somebody being dead and then not being dead. How, you haven't, you have, how do you establish what the cause of that situation is? How, would, how do you establish what the cause of that? Because dead people don't come back from the dead by natural causes. How do you know? Huh? How do you know? How do you know? Well, as far as I've observed, it's the same way you know. You, you have no, no, that. no, no. This is the black swan fallacy. You're, you're, you're concluding that because you haven't observed anybody coming back from the dead by natural causes, that when you actually okay. were able to confirm that somebody did come back from the dead, it couldn't have been natural. And, and you can't conclude okay, Matt, that. Hey, Matt, I've never heard of the, I'm not familiar with the black swan fallacy. Sure, the black, please, the, black with... sure the black swan fallacy is once upon a time, um, the only swans we knew of were white. And so someone would argue that there are no black swans because nobody's ever seen a black swan. Well, it turns out there are black wow. swans. I saw them in Australia. And basically, it, it, it is this argument that because something hasn't been observed or, as possible, therefore it is impossible. So the fact that you, you aren't aware of any natural process by which somebody could come back from the dead does not mean you can conclude that it must have been supernatural. That's an argument from ignorance. But could we, in, could we infer that the best explanation of Jesus rising from the dead? How can the best explanation? Yeah. How, okay, so a supernatural raising of the dead is miraculous and we have no evidence for it. We can't examine it. We have no evidence for that we can say, yes, this sort of thing happened, this sort of miraculous thing happens. So how could, you ever, how could you ever determine that the best explanation is the one that by definition is the least probable? Because you don't use a relative frequency theory, um, which sounds like that's what you're doing there. To, that doesn't always work. Well, here's the thing. If there have been exactly zero confirmed miracles, how do you ever conclude that a particular instance was that the best explanation was that it was miraculous without demonstrating that it was? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following your question. Sure. If, if I've, uh, in the entire history of the world, how many confirmed miracles have we had? In the entire, in entire history of the world, how yeah. many confirmed? How many times have we confirmed I, that something happened as a result of supernatural intervention? I, I have no idea. The answer is zero. There, there's none. There, I, there's no confirmed instances of supernatural. This is the reason why science can't appeal well, to the supernatural, that? because we can't... The only way you could say that, Matt, the only way you could say that if you've investigated every claim. No. no. Been... So, all right. Um, so I understand what your objection here is with regard to me making this universal negative declaration. That's not the, the case. The science, we are, we, are, we are prohibited. We have no way to confirm supernatural existence or causation. What what well, method do we have by which we could ever confirm or currently confirm that the supernatural exists or that it interacts in reality? Well, I mean, I I, I could think of I could think of a few. Okay. Um, okay. If it happened, how, how could you possibly confirm X happened because of supernatural influence? Well. Um, the way the way that a, a miracle is defined, I think there's two ways that we could we could confirm it if it happened. By, but two things have to two things have to happen. One, it needs to be an event that that violates natural law, and secondly, there needs to be um, it, it needs to be surrounded by um, a religious context. Okay. Uh, okay. For example, for example, if this happened, if my preacher. Let's say I went to church and my preacher was preaching, and ISIS came in, and and ISIS jihadis came in and and took over the the congregation, and in front of all of us they beheaded our pastor, and and then they 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 ran 
they ran out. And then the FBI came in and they arrested them for what they for what they did. They they caught them. And then the next Sunday, we were wondering who was going to be uh, the preacher. And all of a sudden, our preacher walked in after we had seen him beheaded. And he said, the reason why this has happened is so I can proclaim the truth of Christianity and say that Islam is false. Now, if that happened, couldn't we say that that would have been a miracle? So, no, uh, first of all. But do you have any example of anything like that ever being confirmed as happening? In my own personal life? In anybody's life. I can't speak for anybody else. I have personally not witnessed a miracle that violated uh, natural law like what you're talking about. Well, you, you say that miracles I, violate natural law. I'm looking for examples of things that have been confirmed to happen which violate natural law. You give an example of the type of thing, which, by the way, I've seen people beheaded. I've engaged in beheadings on stage, and they can be faked. Oh, but you're talking about an illusion. Is that what you're talking about there? I'm just saying that on, on your description, on that information alone, you cannot tell how or why something happened. Well, if a jihadi came in and he took a sword and cut it all, cut our pastor's head off, and I, I, let's just say that, that that event actually happened. Okay. And, and, how, how did you confirm it? it? I mean, I, I, I don't, we don't need to get into all the on. details of confirming this. The question is, are there any examples like that? Because if there's not, then we can't even get to the starting point of exposing why you can't reach that conclusion. Well, I'm, I'm just saying if something like that happened. Okay, that, and if elephants would, fly out of my butt, that would be a miracle too, but it hasn't happened. So I don't get to appeal yeah. to that. I understand what you're saying, Matt. If you're asking me, have I seen a miracle and confirmed it? The answer is no. I okay. haven't. Are you aware of anyone who has had a, a miracle happen and confirmed it? Um, yes. Okay. okay. What was but the miracle and how did they be, confirm it? Now, but you're saying if they had a subjective... All right, let me say this. Um, the... There, obviously, been in church. You have church members that have said they had cancer. It was verified on, uh, on by the doctors. You know that um, cancer goes into remission as a, a purely natural yeah, thing, I, right? I, I know, I know, I knew you so, would say that. And yeah, I that, and it's very and, and you know what you know what you knew I was going to say that, but I knew you were going to go to cancer. I knew you were going to going to leave the realm of the miraculous beheaded preacher who comes back and go to something absolutely mundane like cancer going into remission. I mean, those, those two things aren't even comparable because if somebody comes in and prays and they have been confirmed to have cancer and they pray and the cancer goes away, how did you, conf how did you determine that it wasn't natural but instead was God answering prayer? Okay. That's a great question. I know. I don't think it is a great question. It's a fair question. I'm glad you're asking it. And I, it could be, you're absolutely right. It, it could be that that was natural causes, or it could be that it was the doctor. Right. So that makes it what? That, that makes it what? One word starts with an I. That makes uh, irrelevant. There's a lot of words. It makes it irrelevant. If you cannot confirm. The whole point of this was to show something that you could confirm was supernatural. And the example you give, by your own acknowledgement, you cannot confirm whether it was natural or supernatural. That makes it irrelevant. Right. And that's why, Matt, and that's why I use the example of the beheading of the preacher. Sure. I tell you what, Chan, I, we, we've gone on for a long time, and I've monopolized this, and, and Jen I, has been incredibly patient. As soon as you have a beheaded pastor that is confirmed by multiple doctors and buried with his you know, head separate from the body... And then the, the, the grave is empty, and he's preaching the next week. Call me back. Okay, but let me ask you this. What, if that happened, what you just said, could we say that that would be a miracle? All the, all the instances that you just gave, because he's been buried for three days, would we say that that was a miracle? I, if it was all well documented and we could rule, yeah. out, we could rule out any deception, sure. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. That's all I was after. Hey, listen, I have monopolized. I know you got other callers. 
on there. And so I sure appreciate the conversation. Yep. Um, thank you for treating me with uh, respect. And um, uh, I, I hope that as a Christian that I try to do that as well in conversation. I think we can learn from each other. And um, I can't stand it when atheists and theists talk past each other and are rude to each other. And um, so it's, listen, it's sometimes unavoidable. You're talking you're talking about people's core beliefs. It's, it's sometimes unavoidable. But, you know, uh, we appreciate the call yeah. and, and you can call us back. You, you don't even have to wait till you have a beheaded pastor. If you just come up with some other really good miracle evidence, um, that would be cool. But on that okay. note, we'll talk to you later. Fair enough, Matt. All right. Thank you very much. This whole conversation. Oh, hey, you're here. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, um, there. Th this whole conversation reminded me of an episode of the Cleveland Brown, the Cleveland Show, mm -hmm. Cleveland Brown, and there was an episode. Uh, it's called the Hurricane, where um, they're getting ready to go on a cruise, uh, but there's a hurricane that's hitting Stuhlbin, Virginia, and in this episode, they find out that Junior's uh, Junior doesn't believe in God. And so later, a tree falls on the house and it pins Cleveland. And the water's running through and it's basically running in its face. It's going to drown Cleveland and everything. Mm -hmm. And so they're all praying. They're blaming Junior because he doesn't believe in God, that it's his fault that the tree fell on Cleveland. So they start praying that God will like, lift the tree off of Cleveland and free him. And the tree shifts and pins him further. And so then while they're, you know, they're all mad and they're praying and everything, Junior uses some basic engineering principles to lift the tree off of Cleveland, and then they all thank God for it's a miracle for, for freeing Cleveland. I tell so, you what, uh, here's uh, Drake. Are you there? Yes, sir. All right. Hi, Drake. How are you? Jen would like to talk to you. <laughs> all right. Uh, I just wanted to say I want to say it has to be like an official debate, but just wanted to fairly take turns with each other talking. Uh, Sorry, what, what was that? I just wanted to uh, make sure like we both had fair conversation, or like we could both have our fair points. Did you listen to the last call? Yeah. Uh, I was listening a little bit. You were listening a little bit. Did you think it was fair, fairly fair? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, you know what? We're running out of time here. we got some more callers on the line, so why don't you go ahead and... and... I guess, uh, tell us what you want to talk about. All right. Uh, it's agreed atheism doesn't have a burden of proof, right? Uh, it's the rejection of claims that haven't met their burden of proof. If something is proven, an atheist should accept the claim, or they would be maybe possibly unscientific. Uh, for an atheist to disbelieve something that isn't proven is okay. It's agreed there is no claim of which is evidently true of which atheism currently disagrees with. So I want to say asking to receive the Holy Spirit, then maybe being filled with emotion, then falling down. What causes this what causes this phenomenon? Um, I think that's pretty well understood as it's an emotional reaction to um, basically a social situation. Um, when this happens, in, for example, in church, uh, there's an expectation um, that people are going to receive the Holy Spirit and that they're going to behave in a certain way. Um, and usually people that, that undertake this ritual have observed it many times. Um, and there's a fair amount of social pressure in some congregations for people to do this. It gets back to the last call. And that is, somebody is told, hey, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They pray, they, get, they have this feeling, and then they fall over. And you're saying, how do you explain that? Well, let's pretend that I don't have any explanation for it at all. But I can look at the possible, or at least proposed, explanations. One is that it's a natural response you know, that's not tied to anything specific about the religion, because we see this in all kinds of different religions and even non-religions. Two... Um, we could say that, oh, they were in fact filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's what caused them to fall down. Now, we've got two proposed explanations. How do you figure out which one is correct? All right, right. Uh, I would say it's 
because because it is worldwide and happens all the time, and that most people accept it and explain it as their own evidence as it being from the Holy Spirit or God, I would say because they ask to receive the Holy Spirit and then being filled with it, or at least filled with emotion, maybe being filled with emotion, then falling down to know that what causes it. So when I'm at the craps table and I've got money on a four and I, and I plead for a four and I roll the four, is that divine intervention? No. Okay, so you're willing to say that's not divine intervention, and yet you're saying that because somebody asked for the Holy Spirit and they think they've received it, that they therefore must have. I would say most evidence currently, it seems, at least seems to point more towards the source being God. What evidence? How how do you point towards God as the source? asking, Asking to receive the Holy Spirit and then falling down. How is that evidence all that the world all the time? Wait a minute. Around the world all the time? Please fill me with the Holy Spirit right now. And me too. Please. No, nope, didn't well, happen. Know, just, and you know what? Uh, you know what? It didn't happen for the decades that I was a Bible believing Christian either. You know, it's fine that you can say this sort of thing happens, but when you exaggerate, we're going to point out how silly that is. Some people don't experience motion sickness. Yes, some people yeah, don't, don't experience motion sickness, correct. Other people do, and we can give them Dramamine and other drugs. Well, not only that, right, but... So maybe, some people, I don't, maybe some people aren't capable of experiencing it while some people are. And it actually, it seems as like most people, if you, I, I do observations, people see it happen all the time. Okay, so when, when, when we've exposed that you don't have any way to tell the difference between whether it's the Holy Spirit or not, now you come up with an ad hoc hypothesis that it's still the Holy Spirit, it's just that there's some of us who can't possibly experience it. How do you know that's true? And, and, and by the way, is that, is that in keeping with your religious teaching? I mean, it, does, it, do you think that God can reach anybody? Or did he just make uh, me so that I can't have that experience? I mean, I believe that some, at least, well, I know, I've been to church for like years, and I believe you have too, you was, I know you went to church for a long time, Matt, but, uh, yep. I'm sure you observed yourself, people asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then falling down, and most people in my churches, and churches, not really, on TV. I know, I went to church, and I've seen it every time I went to church, people always fall down. Yeah, and, <laughs> and so, and so you're going to a church where the norm is for people to fall down, and I went to a church where that wasn't the norm. Yeah, in my church, that was definitely not the norm. So it's definitely not happening everywhere. In fact, if you had fallen down in my church, the one I went to, then someone would have called 911 to get you an ambulance, because that was not normal in my church. Now, I've been to, I have been to other churches. I've been to Pentecostal churches, where they'll speak in tongues and flop around on the floor. Um, All right. Okay. I, I understand you believe that it might not be true, but it's true. They definitely have no. that happen like every day. Okay. Churches all around the world. Yes, we know that people have this experience, and they claim that the source of this experience is the Holy Ghost. The question is, what evidence do you have that that's actually true? Well, my point is, is that the most evidence, that's how I wrote it down, oh, uh, like I said, even if there isn't else other like other than it being God, all of it is currently at least seems to point more towards the source being God. Not, no, not it that doesn't. I've met my first proof. Okay. There's, more, there's how, no evidence that, 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 that that's true. Evidence, how can how can you evidence. say that the evidence points towards God? Because that's what I was going to say. Not only is there evidence, but it's satisfactory evidence because. You ask to receive the Holy Spirit first, so it'll point to God after you've actually fell down and possibly even been filled with so much emotion if we were to test it and then find, yes, there is emotion involved because being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, are, I was gonna, I was, are you familiar with a guy uh, named Jerry DeWitt? 
I mean, uh, most most times people listen to music are what other occasions do people fall down so much at church or any other places or any other places where people just fall down? Why is it a good thing that people fall yeah. down? Uh, it's just what happens. I was going to read it on the Wikipedia page about it, too. Yeah, I understand. Oh, yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Let me ask you this. If there is a God, okay, and there's all kinds of people who believe in this God, and they think they believe in the same God, and Church A, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they just feel good but don't fall down, and Church B, when they think they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they start speaking in tongues, and in Church C, when they think they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they fall around and flop on the floor and fall down. What kind of dick does this God have to be to not actually provide actual evidence to everybody else that he exists, rather than just making people appear to do crazy, unconnected things while they're in church? Well, I mean, if people ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit and their body gets taken over, what, what more evidence is there needed? <laughs> what more evidence is needed? I tell you what, I think yeah. you answered your own question. Thanks a lot for the call, Drake. Uh, because wow. if, if your conclusion is that you really just don't need any more evidence from that, um, you don't care that much about the truth or how to find yeah. it. Well, my question about Jerry DeWitt was that yeah. Jerry has talked about this before, specifically with speaking in tongues, and that is that um, it's a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you learn by seeing this in church over and over again. So it's, there's no supernatural explanation or anything. There's nothing mysterious about this. All right. People learn how to do this. Zach in California, thanks for waiting. We'll try and get through this one a little quicker. Yeah, hi, how are you doing? Pretty good, how are you? I'm fine. Um, I was just calling to ask, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you actually believe that the Catholic Church is a criminal organization? Yes. Yes. Does that, now, I'll clarify. Okay. Does that mean I think every Catholic, every person in every Catholic Church is engaged in a criminal act or conspiracy? No, but I think that the... The evidence clearly shows that the from from the top down, the Catholic Church has repeatedly engaged in criminal acts of not reporting child molestation, shuffling molesting priests around to new parishes, and doing everything in their power to avoid working with law enforcement to prosecute these things because their primary focus is protecting the reputation of the church. Um, and I, I don't see how anybody could argue otherwise. Now that's not doesn't mean that. Um, Catholics and the Catholic Church haven't done all kinds of good things. They have, absolutely. But have they engaged in criminal acts? You bet. Okay. I think I understand you, and I'm wondering why... Okay, so take that behavior, the same behavior that we're observing in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. where we have multiple people in the upper, you know, in the higher-ups, you know, shuffling around priests, covering up information, silencing witnesses, etc. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try and deny that those things happened. They did happen, and they were pretty heinous. But apply that to, say, a bank, but say it's embezzlement, shuffling around money, counterfeit bills even, laundering it. And we're talking about, I don't know, pick any bank, Bank of America. Would you say that that also is a criminal, criminal organization? Yes. Or yes. But I don't know why we had to ship the crime, okay. because the fact of the matter is if any other organization had done what the Catholic Church has done with regard to these child molestation incidents, child rape incidents, um, they would have been sued into oblivion. They, they would have been dismantled. Okay. They would no longer be an organization. And the outcry from the public would have been um, just unbelievable. You would not have people still walking into um, the, the bank or branch of a bank uh, on a weekly basis to keep giving them their money once something like this had been exposed. Okay. And the reason I shifted the crime, I wasn't trying to be tricky by shifting the crime. I just didn't think that bankers would be molesting kids, I, so I just changed it to money. Um, that's why I shifted Yeah, the no, crime. but the, the thing is, we tend to view crimes related to money a lot differently. We, you know, we even have white-collar crime and blue-collar crime and all this other stuff. Um, you, you've got to call it for what it is. If, if the atheist community of Austin or some other atheist organization had engaged in the sort of actions that the Catholic Church did, it would have been an international scandal yep. that would have destroyed all of those organizations. And the churches would have been sitting there saying, ha, 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 this is what happens when you take God out, you get, you get immorality. 
And so if that's, the, if that's likely to be the case, then I don't understand why, why it isn't in the public's interest to, to say, ha, 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 you high and mighty assholes who have claimed this moral superiority, you are more corrupt than the people that you are preaching to. Okay. Um, let me run something past you and uh, just see how you how you respond to it. And Ms. Peebles is certainly welcome to respond. It's not just oh, for Matt. Well, thank you. But obviously, there are, the, there are actual individuals who carried out these crimes they, who molested the children, who covered it up. And it seems like you can prosecute these people to the fullest extent of the law, purge the church, find those individuals. Hopefully, they'll be honest and willing to cooperate. I meant, You mentioned earlier that people are unwilling to cooperate. Suppose they would be. And you could pull them out, and you could still have a Catholic church. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that when I think of a criminal organization like the Mafia, I can't imagine the Mafia with yeah, how can, the purpose of the Mafia is for criminal activity. Like you can't take out sure. a few or a lot, yeah. a majority of bad eggs in the ma Mafia. No, I'm I'm with you. I, you know, it, you know, I'm not saying that the church couldn't be fixed. The problem is, is that okay. it it probably wouldn't look very much like it does now if you actually fixed it. And by the way, th because this... Go ahead. The corruption in the Catholic Church goes so high in the organization that, um, I mean, you know, when, when they relocate um, a cardinal outside of uh, the jurisdiction to, so that he doesn't have to get indicted for, for covering up some crimes, um, you know, the whole organization is, is implicated there. So. And, and by the way, we're still only talking about one crime that, or one category yeah, of crimes. Yeah. Right, there um, are lots of others. You, there's plenty of other things that we can hang on the door of the Catholic Church. Granted, they're done selling indulgences, but the fact that they stopped selling it is pretty much an admission that they were engaged in a confidence scheme bilking people of money for generations. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's totally valid. Uh, do you have any other I'm just I'm not trying to advance the point. I just wondering, do you have any other crimes that aren't from the 16th century? Um, so we have this child molestation scandal, but <laughs> is there anything? <laughs> yeah, because that's the most <laughs> of what I've well, heard. Yeah, the uh, stealing infants in Spain. Um, okay. You know, um, stealing kids, basically running. Um, oh, gosh, how would you how would you even put it like? Um, houses for indentured servants and taking people's children from them. They, what, in yeah, Ireland. what they did, uh, unwed mothers in Ireland, et cetera. Yeah, I mean. I mean, you know. Okay, so I went back to something that that happened in the 16th century because it's a laughable thing that that exposes an obvious con. But um, one of the things is that we can't know the full extent of the criminal acts that the organization is involved in because. Well, first of all, the Catholic Church is pretty much a sovereign state, and they don't have to open their books, yeah. and they don't have to allow investigation or anything. But people have done investigations, and when we keep turning up their dirty work, um, I, you know, okay, shrug it off, it was the 16th century. Why would, if there was a God who was, this was his actual, you know, preferred holy church, um, why would it matter what century we're talking about? And by the way, we... Even if only thing that had ever happened was the shifting around of of child raping priests, uh, I'd say it's pretty bad as bad enough. Even if it was the only one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that was uh, basically all I was calling about. Um, sure. I'm glad that we could discuss that civilly. I know you have other callers, and you have ten minutes left. So, uh, have a good week. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, we'll go to Mike, who, or Mark, sorry, who's been waiting the entire show. Um, hi, how are you? Hello? I got an echo, hi. so you're probably still listening to the stream. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so my call was really about the whole phenomenon of near-death experiences. Um, have you ever heard of Howard Storm? I don't know. The name doesn't ring a bell, but I mean, I might yeah, have heard it. Okay, um, um, just the whole thing, like, I, um, these people, you know, the whole idea is how they, um, they'll have, like, an accident, and then they'll end up going and either going to hell or going to heaven or something like that. Uh, what do you exactly think would be the explanation for that? Don't know. 
but I have some ideas. Yeah, like what would your ideas be? Sure. At the time that people are dying, their brain is deprived of oxygen and is in a state where it's not functioning correctly. So anything it experiences there is automatically suspect. Then once we get to the point where somebody has been resuscitated and regained their faculties, now we have the problem of memory where they try to remember what it was they were doing or what it was they experienced when their brain was fundamentally altered. It reminds me a lot of the experiences people have on drugs. Why would you trust yeah. that your brain is giving you more accurate information when it is demonstrably functioning at a diminished and altered capacity than when it's not? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, that's a good point. And also, I was wondering, do you actually think like, because I've noticed that many of these types of um, testimonies and things like that, like you can find many of them on YouTube. And uh, would you say that any of them could also potentially be fake? Of course. I, I don't see why not. The, the thing is, when it comes to near death experiences, the first two words are really important. Near death. They, they didn't yeah. die and come back. Um, you know, death isn't like, death is a process and we're getting better and better at stalling that process and resuscitating people at various stages in that process. Hey, the light came yeah. back on. Yeah, it's a um, miracle. It is. So you can, you can have a lot of interesting stories from people who claim to see yeah. religious symbolism or have religious sorts of experiences in these altered states. And it doesn't just have to be near death. There's people who reported on, you know, DMT and other drugs like that or in uh, sensory deprivation tanks and all that stuff. How could you ever demonstrate yep. that the experience they had was actually real, that they went somewhere else? And, and I don't yep. know how anybody could demonstrate that. That's the problem that we've tried yep. to, in four conversations today. Scientific investigation doesn't rely on saying the supernatural doesn't exist. It relies on saying the natural world is all that we can investigate until someone shows us how to investigate. Somebody has to come up with a reliable yep. method for confirming this, the existence of the supernatural and that the supernatural can actually interact with the natural world at all. And until then, it's yep. all just stories. And it doesn't matter if we have an explanation for them or not. If the answer, if the correct answer is, we don't know why this happens, then you could never conclude that it happens because they actually went to heaven or hell. If it's an unknown, it's yep. an unknown. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's I wanted to um, uh, talk about a couple of concepts here, and this one gets back to our earlier caller, um, Chan, um, who's talking yeah. about free will. Um, are you familiar with the concept of heuristics? I'm um, not exactly no. Okay, so heuristics are basically simple rules that we use to help us when we're making uh, judgments or decisions, um, and basically what it does is it. Um, it eases the cognitive burden that we experience when we make multiple decisions because we do these decisions all the time, all day. And so these little heuristics help us uh, streamline that process so we don't have to spend too much um, you know, cognitive energy on them. And yeah. the thing about those is that um, they happen unconsciously for the most part. We don't even know we're using them. And that's why it's yeah. possible to have already made a decision about doing something without being conscious yet of, of the decision to do that thing. Um, it's yep. because of these heuristics. Okay. That's what actually happens. Um, cool thing about heuristics, though, is that they can be primed. And when we, do, when we prime somebody, we, we basically predispose them to use maybe a different heuristic or for that heuristic to output a different, um, uh, basically give us a different output. Um, yeah. And people in marketing know how to do this really well. There's a whole field of marketing, you know, a whole field called marketing that, that does this. They prime people yeah. so that you're going to buy this product instead of another one. Or you're going to yeah. take this vacation and not that one. Um, that's what they do. Um, and I guess my point here with these NDEs is that if you look at descriptions of these uh, near-death experiences, a lot of them yeah. are... Um, they reflect sort of the culture that the person uh, grew up in and a lot of the expectations. Yeah. And so if you've got yeah. someone that's very steeped in Christian mythology, 
they're going to report seeing Jesus or, you know, the white light or they were filled with the Holy Spirit or something like that. There's like a Christian flavor to yeah. this. And th there are exceptions. Yeah. Yes, there but, are. But this goes along the same lines of alien stories. Aliens yeah. have pretty much oh, yeah. taken on a fairly uniform, you know, the gray with the almond eyes things. But there's somebody who's still going to see the alien monster. And what happened is yep. the reports were all varied, and then the reports that seemed to be most credible, or the ones that got the most attention that entered pop culture, took over right around the time Close Encounters hits. Right. And Close Encounters gives everyone their image. And from then on, we stopped getting, you know, tentacle wobbly aliens, both in in you know, most cheap sci-fi and in reports from people, and now everybody's seeing the same aliens. Why? Because that's yeah. what other people saw, and they wouldn't want to appear, you know, uh, unbelievable. Right. Yeah. No, that's um, that's interesting too, because I've noticed that many of the even so-called atheists that have these experiments, like the, the experiences, I mean, they'll say that they've grown up in Christian homes and things like that. So it's not like the concept's exactly foreign to them. Exactly. So then that could really make sense as to why they see, like the Howard Storm thing that I mentioned before. It's basically an atheist who ends up going to hell. Uh, and during a near-death experience, and he comes back and he believes that that's a reality, but he did grow up really Christian. He went to Sunday school, things like that. So that could demonstrate that. Yeah, the type of experiments that we would need to do, we can't do because they're unethical. Yeah. What you would need to do is take an infant and drop it on a deserted island and yeah. let it live there on its own with no interaction with any other human being until it's an adult, yeah. and then see if it comes up with truths about religions that exist in the world after having no, you can't do experiments like that. And you certainly, you know, yeah. you, you couldn't uh, just run around deciding to randomly kill people and then resuscitate them to see how many of them have a near-death experience that doesn't match what they already believe, even though we know some of them do. Yeah. We're about out of time, and on that note, I gotta let you go, Mark, because there's one more call Great. I wanna get to. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. As a reminder, after this last call, we'll, we'll head out to dinner. Uh, they're going to Star of India. They'll put the address up at the, right there. There it is, Star of India, 2900 West Anderson. Dennis, thanks for waiting. You're in Cleveland, and I wanted to try to answer your question before we finish for the day. Yes, Matt. Uh, I'm glad to speak with you, and uh, sometimes I think you deserve uh, an award for uh, throwing uh, lifesavers at people who continue to go down the same rabbit holes. Uh, in any event, uh, I, uh, I attended Moody Bible Institute uh, back in the 60s, and I left Moody around the time you were born in the spring of 1969. Right. I left on the same day that uh, Jerry B. Jenkins left, who went on to write uh, Left Behind, the Left Behind series. Uh, I've written some Christian comedy for touring groups. I've written a Christian record album. I've acted in some Christian films and uh, became an atheist uh, all around the time I watched the uh, Joseph Campbell series, uh, The Power of Myth. Sure. And that was a, a great help. Uh, in any event, uh, what uh, I got out of Christianity, at least one of the strengths of it was, its socialization process. A lot of people don't uh, get into a lot of uh, arguments with atheists or over atheism or don't know all the ins and outs of presuppositions and all that stuff. But what they really enjoy when they go to church is the socialization process, the idea of meeting people, the idea of being around people, the idea that the church is there for you when your children are born, or perhaps when they get confirmed and move into adulthood, marriage, and then, of course, it's there for when you pass away. Right. And my question is, um, no one's interested in turning atheism into a, into a religion or having them come up with comparable rituals. But what does atheism sort of offer in terms of uh, the socialization process uh, where people would look forward to gathering with atheists and not merely arguing or not merely just confirming their, their uh, you know, their believe that God does not necessarily exist, but the idea of um, wanting to simply be among other people and, and sort of promoting a socialization with, uh, with atheists or even others. Well, atheism itself doesn't do any of that, but atheists can form communities like the atheist community of Austin, where we offer those opportunities for socializing and 
um, doing things. Like, for example, um, there's a group going to Star of India for some really good Indian food tonight. <laughs> there's also, um, there are a number of people working on this. The, the, the issue that you're seeing, uh, you're not alone. Um, and I've, I've kind of preached before about Sunday Assembly and Oasis and all of these other things that have been labeled Atheist Church, even though I strongly object to that label. Um, the thing is, atheists come in all different stripes, and there are some people who do feel, after getting out of religion, some of them were never in a religion, but some of them, after getting out of religion, feel that they've lost something. They've lost an aspect of community and socializing. Um, that's where organizations like the ACA come in. We fit a certain type of person in, in the socializing they like, which may be, let's go to the bat cruise, let's have some drinks, let's you know talk about what's going on in our lives, let's bash religion for a little while and have a good time. And then there are other people who want something that is a little bit more like what they experienced in a church, where you, you're at Sunday Assembly or Oasis or any of these other things that have been labeled Atheist Church. And I fully support them, even though I have no interest in attending. I mean, I, I'll speak there as a, as a guest speaker on occasion. It's not my thing. Um, the problem here is that there are some atheists, one in particular, uh, I'm looking at you, Tom Flynn, <laughs> who try to tell the people who go to Sunday Assembly or Oasis that they're not sufficiently secular. Well, that's bullshit. Um, you don't get to proclaim the no true Scotsman or no true secularism fallacy. All you can do is say, that's not for me. And what these people aren't giving up or aren't willing to give up is not something that churches own. It's something that religions co-opted. The interactions between human beings, the socializing, yes, that includes ritual as well. Um, I don't think that we need to seek out ways to like inject ritual. I think we should just take the rituals that we already enjoy. Um, potluck is a ritual. Mm -hmm. There are some people in, who enjoy group singing. There are some people who enjoy um, sharing experiences. There, there are all kinds of things. Hey, we'll have an award ceremony or a graduation ceremony or anything along those lines that's secular that, that, that ties us together as human beings and community. I don't think we need to invent the sort of rituals um, for the sake of having rituals. And I think we, we, it's in our interest to expose some of the rituals. That, you know, I watched a video today that was absolutely disgusting. It was a particular type of baptism of an infant where they've got this big thing of water and they're holding the kid by the legs and the chest and swooshing them through over and over and over again instead of just sprinkling yeah. water on their head. And I don't think the kid's in great danger, but I watch it and I cannot, for the life of me, tell you how that is different from slicing a chicken's neck and sprinkling blood all over the place. It is just as absurd, uh, although there's a little less death in, the, in this version. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at least, you know, you might get a chicken dinner out of the other one. Yeah. The thing is, we're human beings. We're going to interact with each other in the way that's comfortable for us. And it's not the same for everybody. There are people who have absolutely no interest in doing that. And if that's, if that, if that's what they want, cool. And as long as they're not sitting there saying, you're wrong for wanting to hang out with other people and have a good time. Um, there's not a problem. Unfortunately, we have some people who are doing that, and that's why I get to go on TV and say that they're being assholes and that they're not good humanists. And uh, that's not a no true humanist fallacy. It's an appeal to the values of secular humanism that identify us as a as a as a, as a species that interacts and enjoys community and and in some cases ritual. But ritual doesn't have to be dressed up in the way that religions do it. Ritual could be anything. I, I, mean, I ritually shower. I ritually rub oil in my beard. I, you know. do, you, do people um, make you a birthday cake and sing happy birthday to you? On occasion. Sometimes? That's a ritual. Right? Yeah. That's a fun ritual. And I think that, you know, that we're building better communities. Um, I think that's a given. We are a little slower getting around it because religions have had a preferential place with respect to governments and communities for thousands of years. And the secular community has been this much maligned second-class citizen status. And we are just now working our way out of it. We are moving towards atheist normalcy, as Dave Silverman would put it. We are moving towards a more secular world. And I think that we'll see a lot more of this along the way. But I don't think we need to go out and try to invent it. I think we just need to take back what's actually ours and do the things that we enjoy.
Yes, and a, a couple of things is uh, donating blood. I think that's a good secular humanist thing to do. And another thing at the time of death is to to uh, uh, dedicate our bodies to science. Yep. Uh, I think those would be two two things that uh, could be done, uh, or at least suggested. And uh, I, I definitely could suggest them. I I know that there are people who are entirely secular who don't have any sort of you know magical thinking and yet would still prefer not to have their body dissected when they're dead. Right. Um, I, I'm all in favor of having discussions with people um, and trying to convince them of the merits of this, but the one thing that I value ahead of that is individual freedom and autonomy. And on that note, uh, Dennis, I'm gonna let you go because we need to wrap up, and I'm gonna close with one thing that happened in email this week, but I appreciate the call. Great, thank you very much, Matt. Sure. So this is an email that we got from somebody who was like, if you're involved in a conversation with somebody and they say that they're, you know, they're a theist and you're an atheist and they don't want to talk about this anymore, isn't it sometimes a good thing to push them anyway? No, you're an asshole. What you're engaging in is asshole behavior. You are saying that your desires trump theirs. Now, is it okay to suggest to them that you'd like to continue having a conversation and that they may actually benefit from it and that you think you might? Absolutely. That's not push. When somebody tells you, I don't want to have this conversation anymore, and you push them, you are exerting you, that you are in some position of superiority over them. And not only are you being an asshole, but you're unlikely to actually engage in anything positive because you have to recognize that your audience has already shut down and all they're gonna do most likely is stare at you stone-faced and ignore you. And his response to this was, no, 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 what if they know the location of a bomb? Okay, now we're not talking about beliefs anymore, <laughs> we're talking about something that's actually actionable. Well, no, no, what if the person that you pushed into a conversation or the person that you refused to push into that conversation um, becomes the next Joseph Smith? Well, first of all, Joseph Smith was a con man, so I don't think talking to him about what his beliefs are would have had been any good. But what if the person that you refuse to push um, becomes the next Reverend Barry Lynn and stands beside you and fights for the separation of religion and government despite the fact that you disagree on the God thing? Or what if the person that you push and you've managed to convince them for bad reasons, because if you're going to be an asshole to people and invade their, their personal, Trump, have your will trump theirs, you're probably not making good arguments anyway. And so the person that you've pushed gives up their religious belief and then becomes one of these anti-religious people who, in the name of atheism, even though atheism doesn't do this, go out and impose anti-religious stuff. What if, you, what if you create the next Stalin? You don't get to cherry pick the thing you're trying to avoid and use it as the one example that justifies why you think you get to be an asshole. On this show, we don't make outgoing calls unless they're requested. We don't go door to door saying, hey, if you stop believing in Jesus, we can help. We have conversations with the people who want to have conversations and to the extent that they want to. They get to hang up whenever they want. And guess what? So do we. Yes, it's a good thing to encourage people to challenge their beliefs. It's a good thing to encourage people to question their beliefs. And when people start to shut down, it may in fact be a good thing to say, before you shut down completely, I just want you to know that I'm doing this for these reasons, because I care about what kind of world we live in, because I'd like to learn something from you. But the type of person who says, is it okay to just push after they've shut down, isn't actually interested in those things. They're the type of online, I have to be right and show that you're wrong and embarrass you as much as possible so that I can maybe stop feeling like the second class citizen that your religion has made me feel like. And you're not fucking helping one bit. We'll see you next week, bye-bye. Hi. Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. 
You know, the Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.